speakers and each speaker will have 15 minutes and we have 25 or so minutes for questions and answers. So I would like to start with Ida Hoops. The title of her presentation is Process for Being Symbolism, Secularism and Islam at the European Court of Human Rights. Muslims. 
Um, also, there has been, you know, for what seems like a very long time, a continuing discussion about Turkey's potential accession to the EU, and the question of religion is one that plays, you know, albeit perhaps an unstated um, role in that discussion of Turkey potentially acceding to the European Union. Um, despite the fact, though, that within Europe this idea of secularism has always been equated to progress in a sense. Um, despite this, sociologists of religion um, who have conducted studies in this area would kind of say that you know religious belief in Europe remains stubbornly high. Okay, so you have you know the, the idea that in uh, some European states, Ireland, where I'm from, for example, in states such as Poland retain references to God in their in the basic law of their states, okay, so in the constitution of both countries you have um, you know, the, a reference to God in the preamble to the constitutions. Um, so you have this, this fact of you know, perhaps it not being as secular as some people would say, as I mentioned, the issue of immigration, the issue of Turkish accession to the EU, etc. All of these factors contribute to you know, what uh, sociologists of, of religion refer to as the global desecularization or what Habermas has very interestingly referred to as you know, the idea that we are in a post-secular state, the idea of post-secularism. Um, so for example, he refers to the phenomenon of the continued existence of religion in a largely secularized environment. Okay, and Habermas says that this alerts us to the fact that religion is holding its own in an increasingly secular environment and therefore society must assume that religious fellowships will continue to exist for the foreseeable future. Okay, so this is kind of the very brief overview to the, the backdrop of um, you know, the cases that I want to discuss now. Um, so at the European Court of Human Rights, if you're taking a case, you have kind of two hurdles to overcome. Okay, so first of all, there will be an admissibility hearing and if your case is deemed to be an admissible one, it will then move to be uh, considered by the court and, and all the facts ex exposed. Um, so I, the first and important case, um, considering the issue of, of the wearing of the headscarf, um, is in fact an admissibility decision. So it was a decision in which the court found the application to be inadmissible. So it didn't really examine the case in, in great detail, but we do have some indication and I think some very important statements from the court uh, indicating the road it would follow in terms of how it deals with these kinds of cases. Um, so the, the case that I want to mention predominantly is the Dalla v Switzerland case, an admissibility decision from 2001. Um, and this case concerned a teacher in a public primary school uh, in Switzerland and she had converted from Catholicism to Islam um, and she had worn a headscarf whilst teaching for in or around five years. And so during this five year period there had been you know, no complaints from pupils, parents of pupils or from the director of, of the school. Um, but she was asked in, uh, sorry, by the uh, directors of the the school to refrain from wearing a headscarf. Okay, and so this was, you know, despite the fact that you'd worn it for some time without any problems. Um, it was stated that she was, she was being asked to refrain from wearing it because wearing a headscarf contravened a particular piece of legislation called the Public Education Act. Um, and under the Public Education Act, um, it's, it's section six of it stated that the public education system shall ensure that the political and religious beliefs of pupils and parents are respected. Okay, so the argument was that Swiss state schools are secular, therefore uh, she was contravening this aspect of the Public Education Act. Okay, so she took her case domestically um, and the administrative uh, court and subsequently the Swiss federal court um, disagreed that she, they didn't agree basically that she had the right to wear the headscarf and continue teaching. 
So she took her case to, to the European Court of Human Rights. And they basically agreed with what the domestic Swiss courts had said and used kind of some very troublesome language in, in kind of um, agreeing with the Swiss courts. So for example, um, the Swiss government had submitted to the European court that the, um, the wearing of the headscarf was a powerful religious symbol. Okay, and so the, the argument was that it would have some sort of proselytizing effect on young children. Okay, so simply to wear the headscarf would potentially um, be engaging in proselytism by trying to convert young children as such. Um, so the, the court very worriedly took on board this argument by the Swiss government and it accepted really without reservation this idea that the headscarf constitutes a quote unquote powerful external symbol. Um, and it, it, I'll just read you one short quote which I think is quite telling in terms of the approach of the court where it said that um, it cannot be denied outright that the wearing of a headscarf might have some kind of proselytizing effect, seeing that it appears to be imposed on women by a precept which is laid down in the Quran, and which, as the federal court noted, the Swiss federal court, is hard to square with the principle of gender equality. Okay, so now not only is the headscarf a symbol that has some sort of proselytizing effect, but also it completely goes against gender equality according to the court. Um, and so this admissibility decision really set the scene for subsequent cases concerning the wearing of the headscarf, um, all of which the, the court has refused to find a violation of the right to freedom of religion and belief uh, by banning the wearing of the headscarf, essentially. So what I wanted to do was contrast this with the decision in the Lagutzi case uh, from just last year, which, as I mentioned at the outset, concerns the um, the hanging of a crucifix in, in Italian state schools. And so Mrs. Lauzi had taken a case uh, arguing that this was a violation of Article 2 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which talks about the right to freedom of education um, and also says that uh, parents have the right to have their children educated in conformity with their religious and philosophical beliefs. Okay, and so she was arguing that her philosophical belief was, was atheism, okay, so therefore the presence of, of um, crucifixes in Italian state classrooms contravened this, um, this aspect of the convention. Um, in the first decision of the court, they agreed with Mrs. Lauzi, okay, and they found uh, in, in her favour, saying that this, the presence of crucifixes was um, a violation of this aspect of the convention, this right to have your children educated in with their own philosophical and religious beliefs. Um, and this, as you can imagine, caused um, uproar um, in Europe. It was extremely controversial. The Vatican intervened, um, saying that the decision was wrong and myopic. The Italian government appealed the decision of the court, um, and subsequently, a number of other European countries um, intervened uh, in the case, you know, saying that this decision was wholly wrong, etc. And so it was fairly unsurprising then that the, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights um, reversed the, the funding and found that, that the presence of crucifixes uh, in state classrooms did not violate this aspect of the Convention to have your children educated in accordance with your beliefs. So ministries of education across Europe were collectively breathing a sigh of relief um, at this you know, the overturning of the decision because obviously it would have huge ramifications in, in numerous states where um, you know religious institutes are run by religious religious or sorry education institutes are run by religious orders essentially. Um, so what this very kind of brief synopsis and obviously there are a huge number of other cases where questions of Islam have arisen before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and even with this kind of cursory overview we can essentially draw the conclusion that the, the way in which the court approaches cases concerning freedom of religion has been seen to differ according to what religion is. Okay, so where Christian sensibilities are affected 
um, it is argued that the court is more sympathetic towards protecting um, your you know, right to freedom of religion if that religion is, is a Christian one. Um, so I'm just going to end by a very short quotation from Habermas, which I think sums up the problems that the, the court has, has manifested uh, in the sense that you know, it hasn't yet moved to the idea that um, you know, the Europe is, is, is in a post-secular state as Habermas claims again. So what, what the court really needs to do is to intervene to protect freedom of religion or belief and not to protect this kind of um, a similarly or seemingly outdated kind of idea of secularism that has held sway for a long time. So uh, just in the end of this short quote, uh, where Habermas says, the understanding of tolerance in pluralistic societies with a, liberal, with a liberal constitution demands that in their dealings with unbelievers and those of different faiths, believers should grasp that they must reasonably expect that the dissent they encounter will go on existing. At the same time, however, a liberal political culture expects that unbelievers, too, will grasp that same point in their dealings with believers. Okay, thank you. Our second speaker is Imayu Kabir, and the title of his presentation is Demarcating the Right to Deliver Fatwa. Ulema's resistance against and contestation over constitutional law in Bangladesh. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank Conference on Benefit to invite me. And I'm really happy to be here. So, uh, I'm going to uh, present about uh, the market and the right to deliver fatwa, as you all know about fatwa. So, in Bangladesh, actually, the fatwa issue from 1990s to I mean, uh, onwards uh, has, I mean, it has been debated because it has been I mean, fatwa in many forms, especially in the rural areas, uh, by the uh, country's laws and also by the human rights, targeting the human in many, many ways. So today's in my today's presentation, I'm going to talk about a legal battle. I mean, that was lodged and that was filed in. Secular court and also a movement uh, for the right of uh, Potua, principally that was more led by the Islamists and also the Ulama. So, <coughs> I'm, uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me get some reflection, present some reflection on the history of the conflicts in uh, South Asia in general. In pre colonial South Asia, Syria was not the principal source of law resolving legal disputes. The Mughal state, for instance, was, an, uh, religion, uh, was a religion-oriented secular state. The first comprehensive competitor of Islamic jurisprudence in uh, pre-colonial India was the Fatwa in Alamgiri that was commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Alamgir, Al uh, which actually used for the guidance uh, to, to, uh, for the Jewish in rural India. So, uh, unlike the Mughal, the administering of Islamic law by the British had generated unprecedented political, legal, and cultural effect in Indian subjects. The emergence of a new different law, that is, the anglo Mohammedan law, seems to have contributed to an environment in which new politics of Muslim identity could flourish. The widespread use of Mohammedan law had generated adherence to Sharia, which had increasingly been perceived among Muslims as a central means of maintaining their religious identity. So, let me quote one uh, a few lines from Anderson, who really works on the, the pre colonial legal system. So, if Anglo Mohammedan scholarship endorsed a strictures version of Islam, that same vision was transformed into an oppositional Islam that could be used in the anti colonial struggle. It is one of the ironies of British rule that the jurisprudence which first sought to implement colonial rule in the 18th century could give form to a part of the independence movement of the 20th century. So, however, legal transformation during British India was not only the explanatory causes of great affirmation to Muslim identity, it was also aided by the historical transformation of Islam in South Asia generally, which had begun to shift from an otherworldly to this only approach. 
In terms of resources, of this partition, the seat was uh, away from the inland lands and more, more inclined to, towards the arid lands. There is significant evidence that indicate that Potawas in British India towards uh, I mean, uh, were not only practiced among the Islamic scholars at the informal community level, but also against the British colonial state. For example, Shah Abdul Aziz, an Islamic scholar and the son of Shah Wali Mullah, was probably the first ulama who showed political resistance against the British colonial, colonial power by declaring uh, British India as Darul Haq, that is the, I mean, that is not the land of Islam. So, this ruling has mo had mobilized some of his powers to wage jihad against the British, though they were not successful at the game. For, for example, Syed Ahmad Bardali of Northern India, a disciple and follower of Shah Abdul Ajit, lands Tarika Muhammadiyah, that is the pot of Muhammad, movement in 1826 that shall to reestablish Calcutta based Muslim state by waging jihad against the British and British. Uh, other non Muslims and living in British. So, Fatwa did uh, not only provide incitement to the political grievances against the British authority, it was also used as a means of generating debates among Islamic scholars of different sectarian and sub sectarian groups on the question that what really constitute proper Islamic belief practices of Muslim identity. Uh, this first has a tendency of othering other Muslims informed by the tradition of this group of scholars' orientation and practice. So <clears throat> let me, I mean, uh, in post-colonial South Asia also, these traditions of uh, I mean, the trend of othering other Muslims, also the trends of othering I mean, other people also uh, largely remain in many political activism and in many issues. So let me focus on the politics of Islam in Bangladesh, especially on, uh, I mean, focus on photo issues. So the increasing dominance of linguistic cultural features in nationalistic politics had undermined the role of religion in the formation of the nation state as the Bangladesh, and it was reflected in four fundamental principles of the past constitution of Bangladesh of 1972, which adapted secularism, nationalism, and socialism. So the prescription of political use of religion until the late 1970s had undermined the agenda of the Obama and the Islamists. Uh, Largely, we were, who were earlier much concerned about the Islam addition of the society. However, the Ulama and the Islams began to rally to advance the Islam addition project, when Islam re emerged as a state utility of Bangladesh state under the circumstances of military regimes and political turmoil, especially from the late 1970s to 1990. This had significant implication in politicizing the population in later period in Bangladesh. In, for example, in 1984, uh, one Devonese scholar, uh, also he later returned to an Islamist, issued a fatwa against the then military ruler of Bangladesh. He proclaimed that the military regime was un Islamic and illegitimate since he, the military ruler did not come to power with the consent of the people. Fatwa issue has gained prominence mainly in the 1990s and, of course, coincidentally, after the notorious fatwa of Ayatollah Khamenei against Salman Ruzi in 1988. In early 1993, the first fatwa instance, uh, uh, which uh, uh, the, uh, got wide and influence uh, media attention, was the fatwa against a 22 year uh, old woman, the name was Nujahan, who was accused for adultery in the northeastern district in Bangladesh. In the same year, uh, Ulama and some Islamists issued fatwa against Taslim Anasrin, who is a famous novelist uh, in Bangladesh for her blasphemous writing. Nasrin was compelled to leave the country and still continued to lead an inside life. Earlier fatwa, um, I mean, the Ulama and Islamists actually, uh, they, were, they were much concerned about fatwa in the sense that they practiced in religious forms and religious circles, but increasingly it became politicized in Bangladesh society. So let me uh, mention one more point that is, Fatwa has been uh, intermingled with the traditional arbitration, arbitration system that is called Shalis, which has been in practice for long as a way of resolving minor disputes in community level. The use of Sharia based norm in Shalis probably is a recent and modern development, largely influenced by the Islamic reformist republic's augmentation. It would be misleading to assume that the Islamists dominate the body of a Salish, I mean the rural arbitration system, 
and thereby the arbitration committee and family schools according to Sharia norms as a way of pursuing their political agenda. Islamists are less successful in gaining uh, uh, electoral success in uh, many parts of Bangladesh, so it's difficult to assume that they are, they are the main responsible. So let me focus on the other issues. That is, the increasing instances of Ottawa's has been debated according to two, two mainstream political uh, national debates, foreign national debates. One, one is the secular liberalists who were our gene, who were always claiming that Ottawa should be banned, and other were the Islamists who were saying no Ottawa is a part of Islam. So, in this context, so the High Court of uh, Bangladesh I and mean, the Secular Court, of course, uh, issued a judgment, I mean, proclaimed a judgment that declares Ottawa illegal. So, let me quote from the verdict. Ottawa means legal verdict. In broad sense, it means legal verdict proclaimed by Ottawa's individual and legitimate authority. The legal system of Bangladesh has given authority only to the court to resolve legal dispute based on the principles of Muslim and other existing laws. Thus, we rule that any kind of Ottawa, including the said one, is unauthorized and illegit illegitimate. Many Lama Matusha graduates and Islamists consider the hyperbaric as a serious asshole to Islam. For example, one of the Islamists, his name is Bukti Kozulak Amini, declared a Ottawa against the party of the High Court. Uh, and declaring the, uh, the justices of the High Court as apostate. The Islamist and the Ulama vote for regaining the right to deliver Ottawa, who is uh, considered as an integral part of scholarly practices in Islam. To them, many effort on Ottawa is an anti Islamic endeavor by the state. In the early days of, uh, uh, in the early days of uh, I mean, February 2001, the movement that was announced under the banner of Islam must have committed that is, Committee for the Implementation of Islamic Law, headed by Mukti Amini, had turned into a violent form when several protesters in the district of uh, in the district of Bangladesh were killed. The, lead, the leader of the main opposition party, I mean, the secular liberal opposition party, uh, I mean, had attended the protest rally in the district where the confrontation took place and gave moral support to the grievances of the protesters. Subsequently, the movement turned to an anti-government agitation. The Islamists believe that the movement has caused to the downfall of the government and lead to the landslide victory of a government that had Islamic parties in coalition. So I will, within a few lines, uh, I would like to conclude, but before that, I would quote one Islamist who, uh, I mean, views, uh, how he views the state law in Fatwa. Uh, so he was uh, telling me that man made constitution would not be effective unless enacting Islamic law in this state, Fatwa will continue. We will not interfere on any part of the state law. That means we will not execute the law and show the law by ourselves. There are so many other legal issues, for example, in cases of offering prayer, fasting and hajj. In these cases, people follow our fatwas that we proclaim to them. This is not contradictory with government. The Islamic law that is fatwa will not be contradictory contradictory with the state since the conventional law would be abolished when Islamic government would be formed. In May 2001, more than a decade after, the Supreme Court revised the earlier verdict of the High Court and promulgated Ottawa as legal only, quote unquote, religious matters. According to the previous verdict, I mean, quote unquote, properly educated persons may issue Ottawa but cannot impose any form of coercion and force to abide it. The Ulama and Islamists view the new party as their, you know, I mean, a triumph, and while the secular liberal uh, groups consider it as a pragmatic solution that demarcates the religious arena and the violation of human rights in the name of Fatwa. So I will conclude now. One minute is okay. So what we can see in pre-colonial period, Fatwa was used as a guiding principle of legal rulings, though it was not always strictly maintained in resolving legal disputes. Fatwa as a means of political resistance has emerged in British India where several transformations such as legal, cultural, social and political took place over the course of colonial encounter. Administering Sharia law and applying it as a comprehensive and universal guide to control the Muslim subjects by the colonial in British India had contributed to the emergence of an informative and instrumental sense of Muslimness based on which Muslims began to co with their distinct religious and political identities. 
So the political exposition of folklore is a recent uh, development in post colonial context in South Asia generally and in Bangladesh particularly, as we have seen already. I mean, however, it seems that the Islamists will compete with quote and unquote twisting pressures, that is, democratic quality and also secular liberal forces, do not deliberately implement the Sharia norms in the rural Bangladesh. Rather, the power nexus between the rural elites and the rural clergy and who implement the legal prescription of Islam in a context where the effective implementation of constitutional law is largely absent in, uh, among the rural impoverished people. The Islamists endorse the practice of author to that extent that it would not violate the state law. I mean, still to them and other Islamic scholars such as Ulama as well, author is the breathing tool by which they can connect by scholarly interactions with the labor scene in a context that they are no more solid interpreter of Islam due to increasing fragmentation of Islamic knowledge and tradition. On the other hand, the political mobilization for the rights to, to deliver fatwa was a part of the project of Islamists who popularized Islam as an important aspect of social, cultural, and political lives among Bengali Muslims. Therefore, the continuity of the nexus between Islam and politics has facilitated the resistance against the state in which the fatwa should have been mobilized like any other issues that goes against Islam, quote unquote, and its tradition. The revised verdict of the country's Supreme Court, though, demarked a boundary in which proclamation of fatwa would be legitimate, the separation between the religious, I mean, quote unquote, and non-religious, also quote unquote, spaces would be far more challenging if Islam continued to be I mean, influenced I and mean, continued to be dominant on shaping and reshaping the nature of politics, not only among Islamist groups, but also secular liberal, liberal political fronts. So, thank you all. That's my presentation. Last but not, last but not least, Brandon Kenhammer, and the title is Construction, the Relationship Between Islam and Democracy in New Democracies. The Sharia Implementation Controversy in Northern Nigeria. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to have uh, four basic parts of my talk today. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Nigerian Sharia Controversy, uh, which begins in 1999. I'll tell you a little, bit about, a little bit about my theoretical story and the methods I use. I'll tell you a little bit about my data and findings, and I'll offer some sort of preliminary conclusions. Um, so 1999 was a really big year in Nigerian politics. This was the year that Nigeria had its first democratic transition in 16 years. Um, we're on our, uh, it's going to be our 13th anniversary of the Fourth Republic next month. So this is Nigeria's longest, most successful, God help us, civilian regime. Um, things have not always gone particularly well. Um, but it was also the year that for the first time we had in Nigeria real mass movements and demonstrations for the um, this was sort of an unprecedented thing in the history of Nigeria before there had been a number of debates um, about the role of Sharia in the political community, but this was the first time that you had subnational units, states in Nigeria, that were actually attempting to implement state-sponsored Sharia. Um, there was a great deal of popular support for this. Um, the strategies that the different states adopted were, I mean, they varied tremendously. You had some states that were issuing one-page proclamations saying judges will go back to the source materials. Um, you had some states that went through line by line and created new codified Sharia codes. Um, you had a whole range of social programs with mandatory school prayers um, and for public employees. You had the state offering dowries for unmarried women, um, the conversion of places like public movie houses into mosques uh, and Islamic schools, a huge shifting of financial resources um, into the promotion of Islam in these 12 northern states. Um, and a big effort to engineer economic development in Islamic terms. You had the construction of so-called, excuse me, Islamic hotels. Um, you had development projects that were called Islamic, um, irrespective of sort of what they were specifically doing. You had the bringing on of um, imams and other uh, religious personnel into the state payroll in a huge way. Um, now Nigeria is split pretty much down the middle, 50-50 between Muslims and Christians. And so as you can imagine, this was pretty controversial. Um, and the national debate over Sharia between Muslim and Christian communities was conducted in often very hostile jingoistic terms, um, as both communities attempted to paint each other as political opportunists, radicals, and proponents of violence. Not surprisingly, these sorts of strategies produced exactly the outcome that you would expect, mass violence in Nigeria, um, along religious lines, often instigated or supported by political elites. 
And so, despite the fact that Nigerian democracy has linked along, and this is what I mean by my, it's still democracy, but things are not going particularly well, there have been at least 50,000 deaths in communal violence between Muslims and Christians in the last 13 years. Um, this doesn't get reported very much in the West, but this has been a real, substantial, ongoing problem. This violence is instigated by members of both communities, often with the tacit support of political elites. But despite the current violence and the past violence, um, and substantially undermined confidence in government, support for democracy among Nigerian Muslims remains very high, as high as among the Christian population. Sharia and democracy are understood in Nigeria's public discourse um, within the Muslim community as being broadly compatible, even reinforcing goals. And there is essentially no evidence that this has changed despite the ongoing violence in northern Nigeria. There's recent Gallup poll data from February that suggests that in terms of their attitudes towards the Sharia democracy, Nigerian Muslims look a lot like Indonesian Muslims, for example. That the, there's a, a lot more moderation than you would expect for, um, given the fact that you've had essentially low level civil war in Nigeria for the last 12 years. Um, and so my paper, in my larger project, oh, okay, um, looks at how Sharia implementation by a democratic government shapes popular understandings and expectations of democracy. And what I argue is that this debate within the Muslim community about how to make Sharia work with democracy has shaped how people think about what they ask for from democratic government. That there's been this sort of mutual reconstitution or construction of both what Sharia and democracy mean to ordinary Muslim citizens. Um, this is, it seems sort of obvious, I think, to a room full of people like us, but in political science, this is a pretty radical idea that democracy and Sharia mutually construct each other's meaning and practice. Um, and so we have these sort of shifting definitions of democracy over time that sometimes look very positive and optimistic for the continuation of democracy in Nigeria. Sometimes they don't look as optimistic. Um, in this sense, my paper is about what John Bowen calls the idea of reasoning publicly. Right? It's about how Muslim communities talk about what democracy means and how we arrive at some sort of common sense of the relationship or compatibility. Um, okay, so how does this actually work in practice? What do I do? Um, well, social scientists often treat religion as sort of being a unified, um, coherent worldview, but we all know that that's not how things actually work. In fact, we know that there's a lot of persuasion that happens, that things, that debates in the public sphere can substantially alter the way that people frame the relationship between the religious tradition and politics. And so adopting methodologies from American political science, um, specifically looking at systematically how issues are framed in um, public media presentations, I to put it sort of as plainly as possible, I read every issue of several Nigerian newspapers over a four-year period that were directed towards the Muslim community, and I looked at the various ways that they presented the Sharia issue, what sorts of language or terms they used to evoke Sharia, um, how they talked about the relationship between Sharia and democracy, and I identified three main sorts of categories of arguments that related Sharia to democracy. Second part of my project involved a series of group interviews that attempted to see how these frames or how these patterns of discourse were reflect, reflected in the way that ordinary citizens talk about the relationship between Sharia and democracy. And it turns out that actually you see a pretty substantial amount of movement. We don't have great time series data, um, but it's pretty evident to me at least that the way that um, elites in northern Nigeria and Muslim elites talk about the relationship between Sharia and democracy has affected the way that ordinary Muslim citizens talk about the relationship between Sharia and democracy. Um, so what did I find? What did, the, what did these, um, these codings and the interviews turn up? Um, the overarching narrative of the relationship between Sharia and democracy, um, what you might call sort of the master frame, is this very important cultural idea in Nigeria that called the dividends of democracy. This is a term that appears hundreds and hundreds of times in the Nigerian press um, in the first couple of years of Nigerian democracy. And the dividends of democracy is an idea that democracy is um, like a transactional benefit that as a result of democracy, now is a moment for communities of various stripes to make new kinds of demands on the state and to essentially to be rewarded or paid off with improved economic opportunity, with greater political freedoms and rights, um, uh, and with, with greater state attention to things like accountability. And so you see, for example, teachers who ask for higher wages, they ask for their democratic dividend. Communities that don't have access to pipe or water or health care centers ask for their democratic dividend. Muslim communities in northern Nigeria ask for Sharia as their democratic dividend, state-led um, Sharia. 
And so within this broader framework, I found three important frames, three important ways of phrasing the relationship between Sharia and democracy in the Northern Nigerian press. The first frame is a uh, framework of rights. And this emerges from a constitutional discourse in Nigeria. Um, it evokes constitutional language, it evokes norms of democracy. Um, but it's not quite the same as sort of standard international human rights language. The idea here is that Nigerian Muslims have a distributional right, that within the Federation, they have a right to have resources allocated for the purpose of um, defending and protecting their religion. So Nigeria has this um, interesting constitutional structure in which formally there's no state recognition of religion, right? there's no official religion in Nigeria, but there are strong norms of not only protecting religious expression, but providing federal funds for proselytization and things like that. Nigeria fully funds the Hajj, for example, um, for about 100,000 people every year. They created a Christian Hajj to Jerusalem and Rome in the 1980s as a way to provide some balance between the Muslim and Christian communities. And so when Nigerian Muslims talk about rights, it's in these terms, right? It's this distributional right that we are entitled to government support um, for, the, for the development of Islamic institutions. Um, you have a social injustice and an economic development frame in which Sharia is related to the idea of um, forcing states to take on a greater role in promoting economic and social development, so norms of justice of the kind that um, Davidson Robinson and sociology talk about, these sort of economic e equality commitments. And you have uh, a holding elites accountable frame, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Right? The idea that um, moral decay is an important part of the reason why Nigerian democracy has not been successful in the past, and that Sharia might be a way for ordinary citizens to hold their government accountable in religious as well as political terms. Now these get reflected in, and I'm sort of going as briefly as I can because I think I'm going to leave some time for questions. Um, these three frames get picked up in the way that ordinary citizens talk about the relationship between Islam and democracy. And so I conducted a series of 14 focus group interviews in 2007-2008 in Sokoto, Nigeria, which is Nigeria's historical religious uh, Muslim center. And I asked citizens to talk about what their experience had been with Sharia implementation over the last 10 years and how they thought about whether or not democracy and local governments were doing a particularly good job. And all three of these frames um, were picked up to really pretty extraordinary degrees. For the, lar for, for the large part, this is how Muslim citizens in Nigeria now talk about the relationship between Sharia and democracy. They evoke notions of distributional rights, Right? Um, and the idea that it's right for the government to preserve the, the freedom of Muslims to practice their religion as they wish. They evoke these ideas of uh, economic development and social justice, that it's the responsibility of the government to provide for an Islamic form of development, um, which varies you know, from sort of you know, mass feeding centers uh, for breaking fast at Ramadan, all the way to some very populist kinds of um, a distribution of motorcycles um, for young men who are going to start businesses. Um, but this is all framed in Islamic terms. And then third, you have this holding elites accountable frame, which is very important in the way that ordinary citizens were talking about the relationship between Sharia and democracy. And here you have um, sort of a, an effort to make this language more precise. Right? When elites in the, in, the, in the media talked about the idea of holding elites accountable, it was often very procedural, right? that we would institute Sharia um, anti-corruption organizations, for example, that would use uh, harsh penalties to deter um, official corruption, or we would have raids on um, bars or hotels where elites were um, drinking alcohol or engaging in other sorts of anti-Islamic activity, so the argument went. Um, but the people that I talked to in the focus groups wanted something far more specific. Right? They wanted institutional review of the relationship between um, elites and the Sharia and the state. They wanted sort of an institutional form of oversight to ensure that Muslim politicians were adhering to the, the, the criteria that were laid out. In fact, there was this effort to, to draw Muslim politicians into this moral framework. Um, and this is, I mean, I've, I've had to sort of summarize in a lot of ways, but this is, these are a pretty interesting set of findings. Uh, it suggests, and this is very similar to what's been found by people like Robert Hafner in Indonesia, that support for Sharia is less specifically about religious orthodoxy. Right? When people talk about Sharia, people talk about the relationship between Sharia and democracy, it has far less to do with specific laws or the, the, the effort to try to necessarily create a coherent top of bottom Islamic society. It's more about finding a way to domesticate democratic government, to make democratic government work in favor of Muslims. 
In my dream, Muslims think about and evaluate democracy in ways that are bound up with their support for Sharia. There's very much the sense that Sharia is a way to make democracy work better. And I'm not suggesting here, because this would be a leap that I'm not prepared to take, um, that implementing Sharia uh, has been good for Nigerian democracy, but that the actual process of crafting these institutions has always uh, defended democratic norms, because it hasn't. You know, in a society that's as plural as Nigeria, it's very difficult to engineer state-led Sharia. Um, but it's very clear that popular commitment to democracy in Nigeria is stronger today than it would be otherwise as a result of the fact that Sharia is bound up with democracy. And so despite the, for example, the, the creation of a, a new radical organization, Boko Haram, that's been very effective at destabilizing the Nigerian state, we see this sort of ongoing commitment to democracy at the local level. We don't see any evidence, at least none that I've been able to turn up, that you've had a mass radicalization as a result of, for example, the ongoing violence. So I'll end, I'll end there. I think that gives us lots of time for conversation. So we have a panel of presentation from Europe to South Asia to Africa.
at the end of our being, where, in my view, was the political status of the system was corrupted. Thank you. Yes. It's a small remark regarding the uh, first report. Uh, it's about this headscarf, secularism, and related issues. Uh, it demonst demonstrates that uh, not only the wearing headscarf is promoting some values, but uh, being a weird is promoting the others too. Uh, this year, the uh, woman called Kerimah Khalis died uh, in January, in the age of 99. And she was the first um, Turkish woman who won the International Beauty Contest in 1932. Uh, what is interesting uh, to us is the uh, speech of head of jury. He said briefly, uh, Dear members of the jury, uh, today we celebrate the victory of Europe, the victory of Christianity. Islam has that dominated for uh, 1400 years in the world is over today. Islam was destroyed by Europeans. Of course, we can't deny the role of America and Russia. Eventually, it's a victory of Christianity. Representing Muslim women, uh, the Turkish beauty came and presented her to us in the swim suit. Uh, we take it uh, as a crown of our, our victory, choose her as a beauty queen. Excuse me, can, can, we, can we just ask a question? Two. Okay, there's one more. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for the Henry Kenhamer. Uh, so it's very interesting that you made the argument that deliberation on Sharia and what it means, uh, how it will help democracy, uh, was a way of making democracy work much in Nigeria. Uh, and it's shown popular support and commitment to democracy. So I was wondering uh, how, did, how the Christian community responded to that, because you said 50% of the community is Christian, and whether they, they were participants in this. And I've got one quick question for uh, Edmund Hughes. Uh, your point of view in our position seems to uh, not only make a distinction between Christianity and Islam and favor Christianity, but also support nation state sovereignty. Uh, and I think in the, in the last years, every decision was, that comes from your point of view in our religious freedom seems to uh, be favoring nation state sovereignty. Would you agree to that? And would you have to Yes, please, in the back. So the, the 
criticism levelled was very much uh, at, at the, the stage of the first decision. So there hasn't there hasn't been criticism of the the, the double standards as we call them as such. Um, in relation to the, uh, the idea that it's reflective of, of nation state sovereignty, I think that's very true. And in other cases, um, cons also concerning Turkey, actually in the Shaheen case and in the, the Refa case, um, the language that the court uses is that, it, well, in the particular case of Turkey and looking at Turkey's implementation of secularism, um, is that you know if if the state believes that this these are the actions that need to be taken in order to uphold this important principle of secularism, then it's not for the European court, you know, which is a supranational court, obviously, to intervene in in uh, how nation states, as you put it. See fit to, to regulate this to their laws. Um, and then briefly on the, the third question, um, the cases that I've mentioned, and, and, and there are numerous others, are from the, the European Court of Human Rights, so which is a supranational court. I mean, what I haven't had time to discuss is the fact that domestic courts, um, decisions of domestic courts essentially mirror the approach that the European Court has taken. So for example, this famous German case called the teacher headscarf case, very similar facts to the facts that I had found in Dava. Um, in the UK, there is an interesting domestic decision um, in the Shabina Bailey case concerning a student who wanted to wear uh, the jilbab to school rather than just the, the shower and knees. And in both of those cases as well, you know, um, the domestic courts have to follow the approach of the, the European court. Uh, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, about, I you know, largely agree with your comments that uh, can be used or abused in many forms, for example, in endorsing particular regimes, it could be authoritarian military regimes, also in opposing particular regimes, that's true. But in today's, in my presentation today, what I really focus on the, how the Padua in the community level or rather I mean rural level can be you know manipulated by particular power nexus groups between rural clergies and also the you know rural notables. Even though the democracy and the democratic law is prevalent in the country, is I mean democracy and secularism still you know, as an important state issue of its function in the country, but why Fatwa issue, I mean, Fatwa, the norms of Sharia has been you know, implicated in, in the fall of world arbitrations. But the thing is, how to, to market uh, the uses of Fatwa? It could be much more debatable and also difficult to demarket because, in some cases, it's really difficult to, you know, clear uh, demarcation between what is religious and what is not religious. Really or rather what is religious and what is secular. So that's the point actually. So I focus mainly from the rural point of view and from the people who are suffering for that. And I call, uh, uh, my opinion is based on that this high court judgment, Supreme Court judgment, which you know art which declared that well for us should have a clear demarcation and it cannot be you know forced to anyone to to in any form of physical form of violence or any form of you know, pressure or coercion or something. So that would be a clear guidelines on how we can protect uh, the abuse of Potomac. But still, it's difficult if the political situation and social cultural context does not support that kind of demarcation. Thank you. So I'm going to take these slightly out of order for reasons that I hope will be without will make sense in a moment. I'll start with the third question. Um, Nigeria's politics are really complicated as a result of the fact that you have this federal system that's designed to explicitly sort of recognize and allocate power among religious and ethnic lines, where at the same time, ostensibly, you have to have a, a functioning federal government. And so, Nigeria, for a variety of reasons, um, it's not possible to form an Islamic party or to have an explicitly ethnic party. It's against the constitutional rules, it doesn't happen. And so, the ruling party in Nigeria for the last 13 years has been the PDP, whose symbol is an umbrella. It's, um, it is what you would expect to be symbolically. Um, but it's a Muslim Christian coalition party. And so really what you see, the, polit the political dynamics of um, the communities are that you have a, a group of elites who find it to be very beneficial to cooperate at the federal level and to sort of turn around and be jingoistic and antagonistic at home. 
um, even against minority communities, you know, where they have politicians that they work with at the federal level. And so, um, I mean, my, my research theoretically focuses on the debate within the Muslim community. Um, but at the national level, the Christian community really doesn't like Sharia. It thinks it's, you know, the, the end of the world, essentially. Um, but as a result of these broader political dynamics, the fact that the Muslim and Christian elites are dependent upon each other, you've had, you know, so similar to a lot of political science literature, literature on Egypt or Syria, you know, uh, about how you get, or not Syria, um, Jordan, about how you get this moderation, um, you see these similar dynamics, right? You, the accommodation that the state governments were willing to accede to, for example, constitutional oversight of Sharia implementation. There's a body of case law now to sort of demarcate what the boundaries are. Um, they removed the apostasy provisions. You know, there's been a lot of southern Nigerians don't often view it as accommodation, but I think from like a practical theoretical level, it is accommodation. An effort to recognize the boundaries beyond which states cannot uh, legislate on religious issues. Excuse me. Now this comes to the first question about uh, so this is a potential model for the Arab Spring. And the countries that I'm interested in are the new democracies where this comes afterwards. So Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria. Um, and in almost all of these instances, Sharia implementation is something that's undertaken at the local level. By local elites, often who are in national opposition, or who for a variety of reasons find it um, provocative or useful to sort of push up against the central government. And I think as a result of that dynamic, you do get these efforts to accommodate, or to limit the scope, or to pitch Sharia, not explicitly in terms of sectarianism, but in terms of these sort of broader moral benefits of the crude society. Um, it seems likely to me that in the countries of the Arab Spring, right, where governments are going to be much more centralized, that this is a model that probably doesn't work um, directly, if that makes sense. Um, in Indonesia and Malaysia have these you know, minority communities that, that require recognition, and again, it sort of tempers things. Um, for the second question, um, these are obviously, with the sort of research that I'm doing, I'm not necessarily interested in historical models unless they're invoked by the people who are debating these things. And interestingly enough, and I don't really have a good account for this, these sort of stories that you hear, you know, the references to things like Shura or to the, the right and guided house, they don't really come up in the local intra-Muslim discourse on Sharia. Now, part of that is the fact that you have this scope of a caliphate history in northern Nigeria that is its own touchstone, um, and that gets invoked a lot. But when Abdul Ali An Naim came to speak in Nigeria, a Sharia panel in 2004, he put off the stage. People are not interested in that model in the north. The sort of Compromise, Islamic democracy are compatible in these sort of theoretical ways. Um, the debates are much more local um, and not as evoking of that particular history um, for a variety of reasons. Okay, please join me to the conversation.